to donate to our church, my father's house, you can do so through, through, through PayPal at solidrockchurchde at gmail.com. Thank you, Jesus. Now for today's freebie. God can put you at the right place at the right time to have the right things happen to you. He can. I often say that if I need money and it ain't, it ain't coming to me through natural means, God will drop a gold brick in my backyard, and I truly mean that, and I believe that. God will take care of me no matter what. All right, a quick review from last week, the cup. The cup will not make any sense in my review because the cup was a story. And I'll try to give a nutshell of the story in about three or four sentences. Basically, this is a really special cup made by a very famous potter. <laughs> and these cups are distributed all over the world. As one cup made it locally to a, uh, a bookstore here in Dover. All, this is a made-up story now. And one night, some rowdy teenagers came to the bookstore and stole the cup. And these teenagers used the cup to drink out of for an ashtray. They painted skulls and, and death symbols all over it. The kid was finally arrested for drugs, and everything he owned was confiscated and taken to a, a Goodwill store. The lady recognized that this cup was one of those special cups. She took out the owner's manual to figure out how to clean it up and take care of it. She restored it back to health, back to normal. Got a hold of the potter who made this special cup. He came and took the cup back to his museum and put it there with a story to tell. And that's your story. God can take you and the condition you in, that you're in, clean you up and restore you and start using you again the way you're supposed to. Amen. So now, with all that said, I'll give my review. Are you with me so far? You sure? Okay, just make sure. All right, good. How many of you would like to have a fresh start in your Christian life? I know I would. Every day I want a new one. In fact, the Bible says that every day he gives us a fresh start. Amen? Many of us have made many mistakes this past year in our lives as Christians. And we have all experienced many setbacks and failures throughout our lives. Sometimes we allow these mistakes, setbacks, and failures to enslave us to the point that we never enjoy the full Christian life that God has given us to enjoy. And for some, the failures of our lives have kept us from fully trusting Jesus with our lives. In John 10, 10, Jesus said this, The thief, which is Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So many of us have been stolen by a thief called Satan. Listen, God always has and always will love us, and he is always ready to take us in, clean us up, and to be used for his glory. However, some of us may feel so beaten up and abused by the world, we may feel like there is no chance for us to ever go back to what it we were created to do or to be. Because we have been through so much that we feel we cannot be cleaned up. The good news is God says this. I want you to have a fresh start in life. I want you to have a new beginning. I want you to do something new in your life. Listen, God tells us in Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, forget the formal things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. God is saying, forget about what happened before. He says, I don't care about the past because it's over. We need to understand that God is far more interested in our future than in our past. I'm going to repeat that because now Tom's not paying attention. He's still not paying attention. He's talking to class. I think we, sh I think we should find him. I think we should too. All right, so for Tom wasn't paying attention, we need to understand that God is far more interested in our future than he is in the past. Amen? Some, some people think that God is stuck on their past. Now, all he wants to do is remind us of dumb things that we've done. If you're walking through your day and you remember something done, dumb you did, it's not God. 
that God reminding you that? Can I get an amen? Either it's you reminding yourself of it, or Satan's reminding you of it, but it's not God. I even know where I'm at now. God is more interested in your future than he is with your past. The good news is God is still saying this. It's not over. I have plans for your life. I'm about to do something new for you. So regardless of the failures you've had in your life and regardless of how others may view you, God still loves you no matter what you have been through and no matter what you're going through. Amen. Amen. The truth is we give up on ourselves. Tim, the truth is we give up on ourselves. And others give up on us way too easy. But God will never give up on us. Never, ever, ever, never, ever, never. Now for today's message. That was a review. All right. Now for today's message. Why are you getting ripped on? Because we love you, Tom. <laughs> All right. In the hands of God, today's message. And there is. There is consequences to your sin. Well, God doesn't remember it. Right. Well, my, my, uh, my example that I'd like to give is this. If I go out and step out of my marriage and get a 19-year-old girl pregnant here at the local college, and she forgives me, her family forgives me, my church forgives me, my wife and family forgives me, is it over? Hardly. Hardly not for her. Now I am tied, not that it be a wrong thing, I am tied to the mother of that child, and I'm actually tied to that, that child, right? And support, and support the child. So even though God has forgiven me of that sin and doesn't hold it against me, I do have consequences for my sin. God huh? Too. Right. But because of your sin, you have right. 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 Anyway, let's move on. In the hands of God, today's title. John 6, 1 through 15. I am going to read the whole thing, so be patient with me. Here we go. You guys got a print out of it. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed into the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where will we buy bread for these people to eat? He said this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <laughs> Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would that go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, and about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were scattered as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began saying, Surely this is a prophet who has come to the world. Jesus, knowing that they in, Jesus knowingly that they in, intended to come to make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Good. Okay, when I hold a basketball in my hands, what is this? It's a basketball. Duh. Right? Right? Every time I play Milton in basketball, I smoke them. 
I just want you to know that. Horseshoes too. Don't ever play horseshoes with Milton. <laughs> Every time I play Isaiah in basketball, I smoke them too. I smoke them. Whew. None of that's true. I don't play basketball. <laughs> anyway, this is basketball, right? It's a prop, okay? It's a prop. It's not even a full-size basketball, but I wanted to palm it. Yeah. All right, anyway. So what I hold in my hand is just a basketball. But when you place it, the basketball in the hands of, let's just say, Michael Jordan, it turns into professional championships. Right? I'm done with the prop. It was good and you know it. Oh, the ball said yes. Put a golf club, listen, put a golf club in our, any one of our hands and it's merely just a golf club. It's just a metal stick to hit a ball with. I know I've played putt-putt with some of you guys. You guys can't play. Neither can I. So, but anyway, so a golf club in any one of our hands is just a golf club. But you put that same golf club and put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, it turns into the best golfer in the world. Am I right? A paintbrush in my hands might result in a pretty good picture if it's painted by numbers. It might. Might, yeah, might, because I probably won't be, I won't, probably won't stay in the lines. Right? All right. But when a paintbrush is placed in the hands of Michelangelo, it turns into credible pieces of art. Am I right? A gun placed in the hands of a hunter is a tool to be used for sport or for attaining food. But when placed in the hands of a terrorist, the same gun can be used for weapons of destruction. Are you with me? How is that the same instruments and the same tools can bring about such different degrees of results? <coughs> Quite, oh yeah. Quite simply, it depends upon who's holding them and how they are being used. This morning's scripture is an excellent example of what you can happen and how things can be used when we place them in the hands of God. Right? Okay, good. So the scene is a grassy meadow near Bethesda across the Sea of Galilee from Capernaum. That's the scene where I just read in the Bible. Jesus has been preaching and healing the sick for most of the day. He has retreated in order to get some rest and recharge his batteries. But when he looks up, they're all following him. We just read that, right? Okay. So the crowd was following him. He turns to Philip because this is Philip's old stomping ground. And he says to Philip, where can we buy bread for these people? <coughs> Somewhat puzzled, I'm sure, Philip replies, don't you understand it would take about six months of wages to buy food for all these people, and they would just get a little bite? He knew that Jesus was kind and thoughtful, but even for Jesus, this was way out there. All of a sudden, Andrew shows up. Hey, guys, there's a little boy here who's got five barley loaves and two fish. I've often wondered what well, must have been like to be that little boy. I'm going to back up and tell my version of what happened to that little boy that morning. I'm going to do whether you want me to or not. Here I go. Ready? When that little boy got up that morning, he was probably planning on spending a day playing with his friends, maybe going fishing, right? Playing with his friends, doing something. And as he was walking out the door, his mom hollers to him, did you pack a lunch? Oh, ma. Oh, ma, my friends are going to tease me. Ma. <laughs> Followed by mom saying, get back here right now, young man. You know you can't be out all day and have nothing to eat with you. So just sit right there while I make you some lunch. 
she pulls out a little lunch basket and prepares him lunch of five loaves and two fish. Now, these loaves of bread are not your top-of-the-line sourdough bread. They are barley loaves. They're the cheapest of all breads. And the fish, I assume, was not salmon or tuna. It was probably pickled sardines. When it says two small fish, what are small fish that people eat mostly is what? Sardines. Now, I'm assuming when I say this, you know, or oil or something or pickled or something. So this kid leaves the house muttering to himself because all his friends are going to make fun of him because he's got lunch from his mom. Come on. Am I being real? Okay. Yeah, someday, buddy, someday. So on his way out to meet his buddies, he sees a very large crowd gathering, and he asks, what's going on? Someone said, see that guy way up there? That's Jesus of Nazareth. He's an incredible teacher, and he can heal people. We all want to hear him preach and see him heal people. Intrigued. The young boy forgets about meeting up with his fishing buddies. And he begins to listen to Jesus preach. He becomes absorbed in Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God and love and forgiveness. He can hardly contain himself as Jesus makes the blind see and makes the lame to walk. He ends up spending the whole day listening to Jesus. And when Jesus retreats, he joins the crowd and follows the crowd to follow Jesus. It's getting late in the day, and as they stand in a large group in front of Jesus, his disciples start walking through the crowd, and the boy feels a tug on his arms and turns around to hear Andrew ask him, Hey, boy, what you got there? Boy says, oh, nothing. Typical boy response, right? Oh, nothing. Andrew looks in the boy's basket and looks inside and says, come with me. We're going to see Jesus. Can you imagine what the little boy's feeling now? I'm going to go see that man that was on top of the hill healing people. Come on now, let's be real. He's going to go see Jesus. The little boy can hardly contain himself as he walks with Andrew, the very front of the crowd where Jesus is sitting. He's excited yet shy as Andrew says, Jesus, this young boy has five barley loaves and two fish. The boy watches in amazement as Jesus takes his lunch, his stinky old unappreciated barley loaves with sardines, and turns it to lunch for 5,000 people, not counting the women and children. The Bible just says 5,000 men. He can hardly wait to get home to tell his mother what happened. What did happen besides being another miracle? What is the significance of Jesus taking five barley loaves and two fish and feeding 5,000 people? Well, I believe the significance is that it illustrates for us What can happen when we place ourselves in the hands of God? First of all, don't don't think what you have is insignificant or can't be used. Too often we think, I am too young. Nobody will take me serious. There's nothing God can do with me. I'm too old. Like God has an age requirement. (laughs) Come on now. What can God use me for? I'm either too young, too old, too something, but God can't use me. And don't tell me you don't think that. You know why I know you think that? Because I think that way. And you put your pants on just like me, I'm sure, one leg at a time. 
you the left leg first or the right leg first. But you put your pants on like I do, so you probably do what I do and think like I do. Amen? Huh? You jump in, sit on the bed and pull them up? Okay. I've done that too, so you're still my category, so. No, you don't. <laughs> well, if you're thinking, what can God use me for? You need to stop thinking that because you're wrong. You would be amazed how many people have come to visit and join a church just because somebody invited them, welcomed them, come on, or told them about Jesus and they accepted. How about that? Listen, you're never too old to place it in God's hands. Never. You also can't say, well, I don't have anything to offer. Or what I've got isn't much. Baloney. Or should I say, fish and bread. <laughs> Think of King David. He has some courage combined with what? A sling and five smooth stones. You too have something to offer. You may not think so, but you do. Remember that boy who had the very small lunch, the five barley loaves and two sardines? That's not even the potluck material in this church. Come on now. If you brought five barley loaves and two sardines, I don't even need to be put out on the table. <laughs> Come on now. No, we'll leave it for you, Tom. Yeah, Tom will eat it. We'll give it to Tom. Yet this boy was willing to place it in the hands of God. He said this, here, take it and use it. The boy had faith. Why? Because he was watching Jesus perform miracles all the afternoon. I remember... Well, I really shouldn't say. I'm just going to say it. I remember when I was struggling with my call to ministry. But I should say, I still struggle with it. Why? Because I think like you. Who am I that God can use me? I am such a nutcase. I'm such a basket case. I'm such whatever kind of case. Just like you think. Right? Don't shake your head at that, Marty. I don't need encouragement. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh. <laughs> so what some of my thoughts were and are, God, are you sure you mean me? Aren't you sh are, are you sure you didn't miss the mark and intended to tap somebody else's shoulder? And he's not here today. Can you believe it? Maybe you meant to tap Todd's shoulder. Maybe you were trying to Hit Todd's shoulder and you hit mine by accident, God. Right? Mm -hmm. The truth is, we all fall short of the glory of God. And we all walk humbly by his grace. For God does not call those who feel equipped. I'm going to repeat that again. For God does not call those who feel equipped. He equips those he calls. If you think like you're equipped already, I'm going to tell you what, I don't think God can use you because you know it all. You don't need God help. You got it together. Right? No, man, he equips the called. Jesus didn't expect the boy to have enough to feed the 5,000 plus Jesus only expected the boy to place it in his hands and leave the rest up to Jesus. It's like that old greyhound saying, whole commercial, leave the driving to us. You guys are old enough to know that commercial, most of us. Most of us. Yep. So place it in God's hand and leave the rest up to him. This applies to all aspects of our lives. Not only does God want you to place your gifts and energy and talent in his hands, he wants you to place your pain as well. Many times we cling to our grief 
and we cling into our bitterness and we cling onto our anger in such a way we cripple ourselves. Just as God wants to take the offerings of our barley loaves and fish and multiply it, he also wants to take what's eating away at our souls, robbing us of the joy in our lives and do away with it. Just like when you place a basketball in the hands of Michael Jordan, it turns into oohs and ahs. How many of you watching Michael Jordan do those thunks he did? And watched. 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 <laughs> watched the things that he did. The backhand slam dunks, the over the circle, the jumping from the foul line. The, I, come on, it was amazing what that guy did. And I'm not saying the young guys out there now aren't amazing, but Michael Jordan was simply amazing on the basketball court. Was he not? Does he still hold records? I think he still holds records. Does he not? Right. How long has he been off the court now? Quite a while. And he still holds records. So when you place your life, including your pain, in the hands of God, he also wants to turn into, it's still up there, oohs and ahs. Ah, yeah, just like that. Ooh, ah, like a fireworks display, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And after you place it in the hands of God, expect something wonderful. When you give God your barley loaves and sardines, it's already up there, expect something wonderful. When you give God your pain, also expect something wonderful. There was an interesting cartoon, and I looked all over the internet and I couldn't find it. There was an interesting cartoon that showed a fourth grade boy standing toe to toe and nose to nose with his teacher. And the teacher's up here and the kids down here looking at each other, nose to nose, eye to eye. Behind them stares a blackboard covered with problems that the boy did not finish. And you hear the little boy say to his teacher, I'm not an underachiever, you're an over expector. But when you place it in God's hand, expect incredible things to happen. But be careful, be careful that you, your expectations of God aren't so narrow that you don't see it. I'm going to repeat that again because Isaiah was talking. But be careful that your expectations of God aren't so narrow that you don't see it. Got it? Got it. Okay. Story time. Another story, ready? A speaker was addressing a large group. He took a large piece of paper and made a single black dot in the center of it with a marking pen. He held the paper before the group and asked them what they saw. One person quickly said, I see a black mark. Right, the speaker said, but what else do you see? Complete silence was in the room. Don't you see anything else, he asked? A chorus of no's came from the audience. I'm really surprised, the speaker said. You have completely overlooked the most important thing of all. Does anybody know what that is? Roby Shaken said, yes, so what is it, Roby? Yep, the sheet of paper. I think it's a good exercise. So when you place your life in God's hand, expect incredible things to happen. Expect great things to happen. I don't even like that word incredible. I can't believe I put it in there. Incredible is not a positive word. You know that? It actually means uncredible. So I'm sorry I put that up there. Expect awesome things to happen. Credible means good. Incredible means not so good. Well, whatever. I, I wish I would use a different word. Maybe I'm wrong. I have been before. It'll happen again. It's okay. Huh? 
It'll happen at least one more time in my lifetime, right? At least once, right? No. <laughs> once a year is not bad, right? I, I go with that. Yeah, once a year, okay, good. All year long, every day, every hour of the day, that's me. Thank you, Jesus, you still love me. So expect awesome things to happen with God, right? But don't concentrate so narrowly on the black mark or on your mistakes that you overlook the piece of paper, that there's room enough to write a lot of stuff. Amen? God can and will surprise you in the way he brings awesome blessings in your life. And I can testify, I can give you many stories of the awesome stuff that God has done in my life, in spite of me. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. When the Christ child was born in the city of David, I don't imagine anyone thought or expected to look for the Savior in a feeding trough. I don't think so. But I don't think anyone expected their Savior to be crucified on the cross either. God has a way of bringing about awesome blessings and healings if we would only place them in the hands of God. Do you remember Jesus' words, one of the final words that Jesus said on the cross? Yep, that's one of them. I think that was the actual last one he said. And with the answer, I'm going to quickly close. He says, Father, into your hands I surrender my spirit. Remember? No one expected anything from those five barley loaves and two sardines, especially that little boy who begrudgingly left the house that morning with his lunch, probably kicking his feet on the way out the door because his mom made him pick a lunch. But it just goes to show the, the awesome places of growth, healing, and nourishment that becomes ours we place ourselves in the hands of God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Well, did you get anything from